is to teach point of care ultrasound for primary applications in family medicine. Um, we're going to go over some basic overview of the principles of ultrasound, how ultrasound works, uh, and the basic nuts and bolts of how to sort of use uh, ultrasound equipment so that way when you go to perform an exam you have some basic understanding of um, the machine you're using and the principles of how it works. It really does help um, to understand how a machine works so that way when you're looking at the image on the screen you very much can uh, understand the image you get because each time you kind of change your hand and, and change your position um, you have to be able to interpret how changing your hand may change what's on your on your image uh, and on your screen. So we're going to go over those applications today and I owe a great deal of thanks to, to, to Dr. Cohen for uh, helping come up with this uh, this didactic uh, seminar. So would you mind changing the slide for me? So um, the whole goal is here is to be able to teach medical students, residents, practicing attendings um, to be able to learn ultrasound for point of care applications which has a great uh, potential to um, enhance patient care, uh, to enhance physical exam, to be used in real-time medicine, uh, and to help streamline uh, patient care to be able to use practical office applications for ultrasound. So this is the beginning of a curriculum where we're going to uh, teach the basics of ultrasound and hopefully uh, evaluate everyone's understanding uh, of basic ultrasound uh, and the ability to understand how it works and how to use the machines. So we're going to use lectures, we have videos, we have some uh, assessments in quiz form, and we're going to be doing some practical applications that come down the line. So we're going to kind of go over the nuts and bolts here to start. Go ahead and turn the slide. So first thing we're going to talk about is the physics uh, and a little bit of uh, how the ultrasound equipment works. We're going to talk a little bit about what the risks of ultrasound are. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the instrumentation uh, and how the instruments work and how um, some practical applications of uh, ultrasound can be used in the uh, family medicine setting. Um, so let's talk about physics first. Ultrasound uses sound waves. Um, they use sound waves at frequencies that are greater than what is detectable by the human ear. So that is above levels of 20,000 hertz. In clinical imaging, we're using um, megahertz, which is in the uh, 2 to 20 megahertz range. Most applications that we're using are somewhere in the, um, probably in the 2 to 10 uh, megahertz range, but really can be used in the 2 to 20 uh, megahertz range. Um, images are created on the ultrasound machine as sound waves emanate out from crystals within the transducer um, and uh, come into contact with tissue densities in whatever part of the body that you are evaluating and then are reflected back. Uh, and so that's those reflected sound waves back in a varying amount and degree of reflection helps um, determine what that image looks like. So keep going here. Um, so these are just some basic um, principles and we're going to kind of go over the, the physics of why this is true in a moment. So tissue that reflects a lot of sound is bright. So for example, something like bone. Um, tissues that absorb a lot of sound waves from the transducer, transducer um, are dark. Um, bone, um, for example, is bright for that reason. Air, I should put a little asterisk there, is not necessarily bright. Air um, uh, has a, uh, a great amount of dispersion or attenuation. And so actually air is kind of the enemy of ultrasound if you want to think of it that way. The reason why we use ultrasound gel is so that uh, there is a medium through which sound waves can be transmitted through to the area that you are imaging. So if you just put the ultrasound probe without gel, you're going to see a lot of brightness and scatter and it, and it looks a little bit jumbled, mostly because the sound waves just disperse out and they're not actually getting to where they need to go. So they need to have a medium to go through. Um, urine, blood, fluid is, um, is dark, uh, mostly because sound waves travel very well through fluid. Um, and so therefore don't reflect back as much. And soft tissue can come back in varying shades of gray. And we're going to go into a little bit of the physics principles as to why that is the case now. So reflection. We mentioned reflecting cause, high reflection causes brightness. Reflection is the property where when the ultrasound beam or waves hit the tissue, there's a certain amount reflected back that is then sensed by the transducer. Um, increased tissue densities, as shown there, have increased reflection and they have, therefore have increased amounts of brightness uh, on the ultrasound machine. Another property to know of is sort of scattering. So when there are small densities uh, found in, the, in whatever you are scanning, they can actually reflect and scatter, it's not really reflect, but they can reflect sound waves back, but they can also scatter sound waves out away in various directions from your probe and lead to a scattering effect that decreases return to the transducer and therefore alters the amount of brightness that is perceived. Refraction is another property. So refraction refers to when sound waves are deflected as they enter any particular medium. Um, this varies with the different amount of 
tissue impedance, acoustic impedance uh, in, the, in the tissue that you are scanning. This results in different types of artifact that can show up on the screen when your image isn't necessarily a pure image and you get some um, blurring or artifact. That's usually due to refraction. And the last property to really know about is attenuation, and this is sort of what we had talked about with air. So attenuation is the absorption of ultrasound energy um, by conversion to heat. Um, areas and tissues that have high impedance have increased attenuation, so that would be bone. Bone has higher um, attenuation than soft tissue and higher than liquid, and this actually does turn into heat. So if we talk about, we're gonna talk about some thermal properties, bone is one that causes high attenuation and higher heat. So um, that's uh, one that's good to keep in mind. Air, as we mentioned, is sort of the enemy of ultrasound. So it has a very high impedance with loss of signal strength, which is why we use gel, so that there's not this large attenuation right at the surface um, and the sound waves enter the tissue that you want them to go to. So flip back to the next one again. So again, those properties really highlight why tissue that reflects sound is bright, tissue that absorbs sound waves um, and allows them to pass through is dark, bone is bright, air causes a lot of attenuation and may cause bright scatter, but it's not bright in the same sense that bone is bright. Um, fluid is dark, and soft tissue comes back in varying shades of gray. It depends on how much reflection is there, how much absorption is there. Um, and that's, those are the principles that govern um, the physical, physics principles that govern how the, um, the uh, tissue density and the acoustic properties um, and the um, media of what you use impact the image that you see. So keep going here. So the words we use to describe ultrasound have to do with echogenicity. Um, so that's really how we describe uh, fluid. We don't talk about, you know, descri describe ultrasound. Uh, that, that's how we describe the ultrasound characteristics of, of tissue. It's not areas of high attenuation or low attenuation or brightness or darkness. We use echogenicity. So this is an example of scanning circles. Um, this is courtesy of Sonosite. Um, the circles the image there can be described with their varying echogenic properties relative to the background. So the circle on the area on the left of the screen is hyperechoic relative to the background. This um, area here is hypoechoic compared to this, like a, for example, amniotic fluid, which might be anechoic, um, which permits large amounts of um, waves to pass through without reflection. And anything that is sort of blends in grayscale with the background would be isoechoic. So it does really changes in echogenicity is the language of ultrasound and how you would describe one area relative to another area. Uh, so echogenicity is the word you need to know. Keep going here. So artifact. We're going to talk about shadow and reverberation. So um, some of these have to do with uh, um, um, scatter. Some of these have to do with some other physics principles we're going to get into here in a moment. But reverberation is when you see a second image created. It's an artifact, uh, a second image created by a uh, beneath an object that is very, very reflective. And shadow is when you see an area of hypoechogenic, hypoechoicity, hypoechoic area um, that is deeper to an area that um, is a strong reflector of light. So um, why don't we turn to the next slide so we can give you some examples of those. So this is a good example of reverberation. Again, I'm an obese, so I don't do cardiac imaging. But this is an echo here. See, I know enough cardiology to know that's an echo. But <laughs> <laughs> LV and RV help, right? Um, so what you can see is that's the, it looks like the myocardium that's being, uh, that's, that's echogenic there. Um, I don't know whether that, that myocardium, I just said no, if anyone knows what that is, or if that's just a normal echo. Uh, but that's a very strong uh, reflector. And what it's creating is this artifact down here. Basically, it looks like almost the same um, picture. Uh, the, the, what is being reflected almost looks exactly the same as the object that was being imaged itself. And really what this shows is that basically, um, if you're looking at this model over here, this is the ultrasound probe. And what's happening is that it's sending sound waves out to image an object, and it's such a strong reflector that they're reflecting back and then being re-reflected back off the probe to an area that's still within your range of being imaged. And this always happens at twice the distance away, and it's essentially the same object that is um, an artifactual object that is reverberated or you know appears twice the distance away, and, and it can actually if you had enough depth, you could see it twice, and then four times, and then eight times. You know, each time, each multiple of two, you can continue to see it, and the strength of that reverberation falls off with each one. Um, so you can probably tell that this artifact, this reverberation line here, is slightly less echogenic than its um, primary image, but it has to do with a re-reflection of the sound waves directed back to the transducer, off the transducer, and back to the soft tissue that you're imaging. So that's reverberation. Shadow, um, and this is a gallbladder and a gallstone. Um, 
you know, we occasionally get to do right upper quadrant ultrasounds in OB, but <laughs> on the fly, um, showing a gallstone. It's a hypoechoic area deep to a strong reflector. So a gallstone is an example of one. This classically happens in, in sometimes in dermoids and sometimes in fibroids, also shadow and, and gynecology applications, where you have a, a, a tissue density that is reflecting enough light that it creates this acoustic shadow underneath, and it usually follows in this wave out from, uh, you know, it almost kind of looks like there are almost diagonal lines heading out from that, that gallstone um, that really show the, the sound waves being reflected back and therefore not allowing anything underneath to have um, sound waves penetrate so you see a hypoechoic area there. Keep going. So theoretical risks of ultrasound. Um, there really have not been any demonstrated risks to ultrasound. So the principle, but, but that doesn't mean we should be using ultrasound willy-nilly all the time, you know, every single OB visit scan everything around, it, it, there, because we don't know for sure. Uh, in reasonable application, there has never been shown to be any harm. Um, there are theoretic risks. Um, the one we think about most has to do with heat. So there is a physical property called the thermal index, um, which is defined as um, in units of, of, uh, of, of measure in, in uh, single digits, so thermal index of one, of two, has to do with the amount of um, heat uh, generated to raise a temperature of the tissue you're imaging by one degree Celsius. So a thermal index of one or one and a half has never been shown to be uh, harmful in any obstetric application or, or, um, or otherwise, but you can get increases in potential risk for harm the higher the thermal index becomes. So the principle governing how ultrasound should be used safely is called ALERA, which is as low as reasonably uh, achievable or as low as reasonably possible if you want to think of it that way. The amount necessary to obtain an appropriate image and to do what is needed to be done without um, exposing a patient to excess harm. Um, and so um, the one other point up there about for first trimester Doppler, and we're going we're to talk about, a little bit about Doppler in a little bit. Doppler generates significantly more heat um, to create a Doppler image. And so if you are doing Doppler assessments of, for example, a fetus in the first trimester, there is this theoretic risk of, of, uh, of heat um, and a thermal effect on a first trimester embryo. Um, and no one exactly knows what that, um, what that risk is, but there's a theoretic risk to it. And there aren't always, there isn't always a reason to necessarily do a Doppler in the first trimester of a, of a fetus. So that's not something that comes up all that often anyway. So it's just not something we, we typically um, would do. Um, now the, the World Health Organization has done a, a large um, uh, meta-analysis of all the data on um, an ultrasound. There's been studies of, you know, 60 some studies, thousands and thousands of people that have never really shown a harm. Although there was an interesting trend for uh, <laughs> um, male uh, fetuses that were scanned for their anatomy scan had a trend towards non right handedness. Whether that's clinically significant or not, I don't really know. Probably not. Um, although, unless, unless they go to medical school, there's only going to be one left handed desk in the front row, right? Is that how it usually works? So, um, but there really has not really been shown to be any harm to standard obstetric ultrasound using the principle of Valera.